Well, here's a thing you've probably never seen before, though probably for good reasons. This is an MSI Mega 180, and believe it or not, this is, in a sense, one of the earliest quick start machines ever made. It, it doesn't much look like that, though. It, it really just looks like a cheap car stereo, and that's pretty much what it is. This thing can play CDs, and if we uh, switch modes here, it's also an AM FM radio. So when I say this is a cheap stereo, I'm not kidding. This is literally like something you'd pick up for $60 at a grocery store, you know, not even a proper electronic shop. Uh, but if we take a peek at the back here, it's uh, also clearly a PC. But as you might already have guessed, it's not both at once. The uh, monitor here is hooked up, but nothing's doing because uh, the machine's powered off. No fans spinning. However, if we spin this around here, turn off the hi-fi and turn on the PC, it springs right to life and boots into Windows XP. So yeah, there's uh, not much point bearing the lead here. The MSI Mega 180 is a standard PC and a very simple bookshelf style stereo that both just happen to be in one box. Uh, and the idea of course is you can listen to music without the noise and power consumption of a PC while also not taking up any extra space uh, with a separate stereo or requiring a separate set of speakers. Of course, as we all know, I've been a huge nerd my entire life, so I have not actually turned off my computer in nearly 30 years. This, therefore, has zero appeal for me, but there must have been some demand because MSI made a whole gaggle of them. The 180 was only one model in the series. There were at least four others that I'm aware of. They look different, but they're all basically identical as far as I can tell. Like one of them has what looks like a more sophisticated front panel, uh, but fundamentally they all do the same stuff, right? It's just a CD player and a radio. Now, curiously, MSI also used the Mega brand with several things that weren't PCs, including MP3 players like the Mega Stick and the Mega Player. And this is odd because MSI claims that MEGA stands for MSI Entertainment and Gaming Appliance. MP3 players don't seem like strong gaming machines to me. What do I know, though? I mean, maybe they got Pong on there. Um, certainly, though, I can't see how the name would apply to the MEGA cache. That was just a portable hard drive. Now, given that MSI is not generally a consumer device company, as far as I know, we can guess that they didn't make any of these. You know, it was all just a desperate attempt to brand some generic sludge for a bit more profit. But as far as I can tell, they did make the Mega PCs. And that makes sense, since MSI were and are prolific purveyors of PC motherboards. So let's take a quick spin around this guy. You'll have to accept my apologies for the extremely reflective mirror finish on the front. It was the style of the time. This thing actually came to me with the uh, protective film still on it. I had to peel that off, and unfortunately it made it a lot more reflective, so I almost wish I'd left it on. Uh, but uh, hopefully you can make out what's going on. So, um, starting on the front here, uh, with the machine off, it displays the current time. And if we turn on the hi-fi mode, we get a very simple stereo interface. Now to some folks' disappointment, this is not a VFD or an LCD. It's just an array of colored LEDs with shaped masks over them. Not to say it doesn't look cool, it's just worth pointing out that this is one of the cheapest possible display technologies, sort of a theme with this thing. Uh, the interface is very basic. We've got uh, our volume knob here, we've got playback controls, and we've got the mode button that switches between CD and radio. Uh, if we press the volume knob, it switches between a few options. Uh, for instance, we've got the, uh, the four standard EQ presets up here. Although, from my position, I can actually not see those. I have to look over at the camera viewfinder to see if I have them selected because there's a little um a little ridge up here and the display is actually recessed. I I'm not like standing right now. I'm only about, you know, eight inches above this thing and I still can't see those. So great design decision there. After that, uh, we can set the clock. Now this is strange because we do that with uh, the volume knob here, but it only goes forward. Turning it right adjusts the minutes. Turning it left adjusts the hours. <laughs> Now, I can see exactly why this happened, but it's still incredibly chintzy. Anyway, anyway, um, next up, we've got the SRS Mega Bass option, and that's it. Uh, in CD player mode, this would also let you access repeat play, but that's all of the settings. Uh, also in that mode, the playback controls do exactly what you'd expect, but in radio mode, they become tuning controls. You can uh, seek forward or back. 
and that's all you can do. There's no way to tune manually. And then, now this isn't really a big deal. Almost nobody wants to tune manually. I mean, usually if a signal is intelligible, the radio is going to lock in on it. But the fact remains that almost any normal dedicated radio has manual controls. So here they've compromised on even that basic feature. Uh, now, once you find a station, you can save it. Uh, let's see, we press play. There we go. Then we select a preset and press in on the knob. I had to read the manual to figure out how to do that because I figured I'd just hit play again. Uh, and now if we hit stop, uh, we can, uh, well, uh, oh, right, right, sorry. We <laughs> Then we use the volume knob to select presets, not the forward and back buttons, but whatever, you know, it works. And um, there you have it. That's, that's the hi-fi. It plays CDs and the radio, and it doesn't do much more than that. Uh, the only thing I haven't been able to show you is, uh, per the manual, this thing came with a remote. I don't have that, but... Well, it's, it's a remote. I'm sure it could do all the same things we just did, just, just remotely. This was universal for any contemporary stereo. Uh, one thing that is missing, though, uh, which most cheap radios did have, is a battery backup. Usually, a, a little bookshelf stereo would have a 9-volt battery to maintain the uh, clock and the radio presets, but uh, if I unplug this thing and then plug it back in... Womp womp. <laughs> blinking zero like a VCR. Actually, no, they, they blinked 12. I never knew why they blinked 12. Right, right, because you can't have zero on a clock. Oh, no, I'm sorry, it's in 24-hour time. Uh, I, I did not notice that before, and I don't think there's any way to change it. Is there anything in the manual about this? I don't actually have the full manual. I mean, I can get it from their website, but all I actually have in paper here uh, is this um, this little quick start guide, which consistently refers to the clock as the timer, even though it is definitely actually just a clock. Does not seem to be anything in here about that. So yeah, this only does 24 hour time. Now, I should point out that the uh, PC half of this thing, uh, like any normal PC, has a real-time clock battery, and that one works just fine. It just doesn't connect to the stereo. There's there's two real-time clocks in here. The PC still has the correct time. So those have to be set separately, and they can very easily get out of sync. This seems kind of silly, but we'll hear a little bit more on that later. Now, below the uh, hi-fi controls, we've got a memory card reader. Sadly, you cannot play MP3s through this, although you can play them from CDs, per the manual. It's kind of ironic, though, because um, the CD-ROM here, that's shared with the PC. So you would turn on your machine, burn some files to a disk, then turn off the machine with the disk still in the drive and hit play to listen to them. Weird, but I guess it makes sense after a fashion. Uh, finally, we've got this button down here. If we hit that, it um, starts to pop this door open. You got to help it the rest of the way. Uh, now, under this flap, we've got the usual front panel stuff. Uh, well, well, actually, we have a, a couple things that are unusual. So we've got analog audio. We've got a pair of USB 2s. Then we have Firewire. But we've got both of them, the 4-pin and the 6-pin. Now, I've seen those both on the same PC before, although rarely. But I don't remember ever having seen them side by side like this. So uh, that's actually kind of kind of neat. Uh, and also, we have a, a, a Speedif input port on the front. Now, I have seen the occasional machine with a speed if out on the front panel, but in surprised me, and I didn't actually notice it until right before I started shooting this. I, I don't know exactly what you'd use that for, but, um, well, there it is if you want it. Now, again, none of this connects to the hi-fi other than the headphone jack. Uh, the machine only outputs line-level audio, which is really quite a bummer. It'd be nice if it had a little, like, a 10-watt stereo amp in the back, but it doesn't. So you have to use powered speakers, but you can get the sound from either the uh, front or the back, which is convenient. Uh, but you can't, like, plug in a USB drive and play MP3s off it or anything like that. All right, let's spin it around. Just unplug everything. Okay, this, um... This looks mostly typical for the era. Uh, this style of machine is what we generally refer to as a uh, shuttle design after the most prolific manufacturer of little uh, bread box style machines like this. And this is usually how they'd be laid out. Uh, you've got the power supply up here. Uh, you've got uh, dual VGA outputs, PS2, USB, 10100 Ethernet. You have a parallel port. Uh, there's a built-in 56K modem. Uh, you've got your audio jacks for both analog and digital. Uh, and then there's an uh, S video output back here. Uh, finally, we've got the antenna input for the radio, and um, at first I thought this this might be like the um, the UK aerial lead or something, but no, I'm pretty sure that's just plain RCA. So I just plugged it into the, the crappiest cable I had, uh, and then it's alligator clipped to a pipe above my desk, so that's that's my antenna. And finally, next to that, we've got blanks for two internal card slots. So all of this is extremely normal, except for the fan situation. This, um... <laughs> 
<laughs> this is obviously not as it should be. Now, there were a couple machines I've seen in this form factor with a bulge on the back with a fan under it probably just a way to sort of cheat the dimensions on the spec sheet but this did not come this way let me um take this guy off so <laughs> yeah um things are amiss this hole is obviously not supposed to be here uh, indeed, uh, from the factory, this thing had an internal power supply fan. Um, it was mounted inside this hole here, and uh, there was just a, a fan grill back here. But somewhere along the lines, the previous um, owner had some kind of misadventure. I, I guess the fan must have died, and for some reason they couldn't install a new one internally. Or maybe they couldn't find one that was thin enough? Maybe there's not enough room, and, and this is all they had? I, I don't know. Uh, but either way... They appear to have dremeled out the old fan grill and, and done a decent job of it, I have to say. Like, this is is a little ragged, but it's better than most holes I've seen cut like this. Uh, and then they drilled holes on the outside over each of uh, the original um, uh, threaded holes that the fan mounted on on the inside so they could use these long screws. And then for power, uh, again, instead of uh, tying into the, the power leads for the original fan, they appear to have chewed a hole in the chassis and hot glued on a motherboard power connector is that hot glue it kind of looks is that epoxy uh you know there's an easy way to find out hot glue will lift off instantly with isopropyl alcohol so if we just spray a little bit on there i'm gonna try not to take this guy off but uh i just soaked this blob that dripped onto the parallel port let's give that a second all right that should be long enough let's see if we can pop that up nope nope uh that is not hot glue now I, I'm not going to say that I've never done anything this janky. I, I certainly have, but usually the reason was, like, obvious. I, I don't know why this was necessary. It, it feels like, at a minimum, they could have tied into the old power supply wiring, and at a maximum, they could have put this fan inside. I don't like poking around inside power supplies, so I'm not going to investigate what happened to the power wiring. Uh, but I will say this. I got this thing at our local used electronics store, uh, RePC, and there's a good chance the person who dropped it off is watching this video. So if you're out there... <laughs> I'd love to know the story. I mean, for what it's worth, you did a better job than I would have. Uh, I just removed a PCI blank and just shoved the cable in through there and plugged into a power supply header. So, you know, I'd have a big gaping hole on the back. Oh, and um, there appear to be rubber grommets on here, presumably to decrease noise. I'm not sure how that would work, though, because this thing is slammed right up against the back of the chassis, so that, that couldn't possibly help. But um, it looks a little bit nicer than it otherwise would have, so uh, A for effort. Oh, but I will say that um, this sucks. <laughs> this this was worth doing a little bit neater because um, you could have cut these wires off, twisted them together, and put some electrical tape over them, right? Instead, we've got some wires just cut off and hanging out here, and those could uh, could get pressed against the back of the machine while it's running and short it out, and, and many other things. Don't don't do it this way. You could have put a little more effort in here, bud. Anyway, anyway, uh, from appearances, this thing looks like a totally ordinary shuttle-style PC, and based on the ports, we could guess that it's from the early 2000s. Well, uh, I couldn't actually find a release date for this thing, but if we take a look at the uh, Quick Start Guide here, first release for multilingual version, December 2003. So I'm pretty sure this started selling in uh, early 2004. Uh, this, by the way, is a bit of an odd document because it looks like a manual. It's very thick, but it's actually just um, six or seven pages of documentation, and then it changes uh, language. Uh, and all this does is tell you how to assemble the machine. And that, I think, is what's uh, most interesting about this PC. Like many other shuttle-style machines, uh, this was actually sold as a bare bone. Uh, in other words, it comes with the motherboard, the power supply, and the case but you have to supply your own CPU drives and uh, graphics card, if so desired. Oh, and, and RAM, of course. And this guide just explains how to install those. Now, this was not uncommon for um, shuttle-type machines, but it seems a bit odd in an appliance-esque device like this. I mean, only enthusiasts ever build PCs from parts, and I've never met a nerd who ever turned their PC off, so I don't know who would have ever taken advantage of this capability. Uh, but the other models in the lineup came fully assembled, as far as I can tell, so maybe this was just MSI covering their bases. At any rate, uh, now's a good time to fire this thing up, so let me get it all uh, plugged back in. Now, right from the BIOS splash screen here, we can see this has 512 megs of RAM and an Athlon XP 1500 Plus. 
Now that is a 1.3 gigahertz 60 watt CPU, which CPU World describes as the slowest Athlon XP ever made. It came out in 2001, so it was pretty dated by the time this machine was assembled. Uh, in fact, the RAM in here is DDR400, which is almost twice as fast as that CPU's own front side bus. Before we boot up though, uh, let's go ahead and jump into the BIOS. It's pretty standard, there's not a whole lot to talk about in here, but there's one setting I wanted to show you. If we go down to advanced chipset features, uh, this is where you do all your like overclocking and whatnot. Uh, we got our AGP settings, and then we have a TV out mode option. Uh, so this is an Enforce 2 based motherboard. I, I couldn't keep the revisions straight back in the day. I only remember the mass hatred for the first Enforce, but apparently the follow-up did a lot better. Uh, I can't comment on that specifically, but I can say that this Enforce is the MCP variant, which included an integrated GeForce 4 MX, and that means you could do some light gaming on this thing. Well, with the built-in S-Video port that we saw in the back, you could even do that on your TV, and that was a pretty hot topic in 2004. Uh, now, while you normally enable that feature from the driver control panel in Windows, if you do it here, it'll be active at all times, including during boot and even under DOS. Now, first, you have to pick a video standard, though, and that's kind of bewildering. <laughs> uh, normally, we're used to um, NTSC and PAL, but, well... Yeah, uh, the first two options here, those are American and Japanese NTSC. Now, I, I don't know how many people in the U.S. would know that they wanted NTSC-M, but at least it's only two options. In other countries, though, you got to figure out what PAL BDGHI is. I had to look this up to figure out what was going on. It turns out there were a bunch of uh, slight variations on PAL. B, D, G, H, and I are all intercompatible versions, so they're grouped together here, whereas M, N, and N, C are incompatible, so you had to know what your local variant was. Now, I do have a nice multi-standard CRT over here, so I could do all these PAL flavors, but I'm a filthy American, so I'm going to pick NTSC. So I'm going to go ahead and hook this up via S-Video. Uh, I could adapt the S-Video port over to composite, but... When you're connecting a PC to a standard def television, you need every little bit of detail you can get. There we go. Now, of course, this is not actually going to take effect until we restart, so save and exit. And right away, there it is, but you will notice one problem. This might be a little subtle. I might need to tweak the video a bit for you to see it, but um, this is not in color. That's in color. You can see live update too. This is blue. That's even bluer. This is not. And you can sort of see the telltale um, mosaic effect of uh, viewing a, a color image on a, a black and white display. Now, I'm not 100% sure what's going on with this. At first, I was going to say that I, I thought it had something to do with uh, which mode the display was in. But let me show you something. I've got a copy of FreeDOS on a USB stick here. I'm just going to stick this in the front. Now, fortunately, this thing does have a boot menu. In older computers, you had to go into the BIOS and um, move around the options every time you wanted to boot from something instead of the hard drive. It's incredibly irritating. This, this has to be one of the earliest computers I've ever seen that actually has this feature. One thing I should say before we continue is that this looks really, really good. Uh, I used to hook computers up to TVs all the time, and even for S-Video, this is remarkably high fidelity uh, text mode, so I'm, I'm pretty impressed by that. Anyway, let's uh, fire up Quake for DOS. This being a 32-bit machine, you can run uh, basically any uh, DOS software you like on it. I haven't tried getting the Sound Blaster working, but it probably is possible. Now, I had hoped when I uh, fired this up that it would come up in black and white. It hasn't. Um, as you can see, it's uh, quite colorful. And at first, when I was messing around with this, I, I thought that it had something to do with uh, the video modes, because I'd fire this up and it would be in black and white. And then one time I started it up and it wasn't. So then I went in and I started messing around with the various video modes. Watch this. We're in 320 by 200 and it's in color. Now we go to 320 by 240, it's black and white. So I thought it had something to do with the specific video mode. Ah, uh -uh. watch this. We go back to 320 by 200, color. We go to an intermediate res, black and white. Now we go to 320 by 240 and it's in color again. Likewise, if we pop over to uh, 640 by 480, oh no, it's in black and white. Hang on, go back here, get into another mode first, then go there and it's in color again. And we can do this with uh, any resolution we like. Every single time that this card changes display mode under DOS, it turns the color burst on or off. And I have no idea why. It's gotta be some kind of low level flub in the Visa code, right? Or, or I don't know, something on the graphics card itself. But um, it means that with any sort of DOS software that you run on this, you're probably gonna struggle to get it to display color on the TV output. 
obviously this is not <laughs> terribly relevant to the machine because you probably weren't going to run DOS on this, right? You were going to run Quake under Windows, and, um, well, that works just fine. In fact, I've had mixed results with this, uh, because sometimes when I boot it up, the Windows XP logo will be black and white. Other times it's color. But every time, once we get to the desktop, it's in color, and I never have any problems after that. Yeah, see, this time around, <laughs> we get the monochrome. But when the uh, NVIDIA driver loads, I believe... Oh, ah, shoot. Sometimes it loads the driver before it gets out of VGA mode uh, and it switches itself over to color. But yeah, now we're at the desktop and everything's fine. And I haven't had any issues after this except the occasional loss of sync. It was not doing this with the initial set of drivers I had loaded and then I upgraded them and it does this every once in a while randomly, but it's, it's not generally been an issue. Anyway, uh, theories invited on what's uh, actually going on there at the low level to cause that, but uh, for the moment, uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn the CRT off because I probably forgot to filter out the flyback wine perfectly, and um, you're going to see more of this thing later in the video, don't worry, but for now, uh, we want to focus on the system itself. The only unique hardware features of this machine are in the stereo system, and MSI apparently shipped this with something called MSI Media Center, which was meant to uh, talk to that hardware, but I don't have that. Or more accurately, I have it, but I don't have a serial number, so I can't install it. Uh, people online, though, say that it's just a rebadged inner video product. I'm guessing the same as the Instant Media app that we saw way back in, I think it was Quick Start Episode 1 or 2, something like that. And based on screenshots, it looks like a very generic Windows Media Center clone, so we're not missing much there. However, I decided to look at the drivers for other MSI Mega PCs, and one of them included an MSI Radio app. I installed that, and to my mild surprise, it actually worked. So when we fire that up, you see the um, uh, the faceplate goes hot, and we've got a duplicate of it over here in Windows. And as you'd expect, this lets you manipulate all of the uh, controls from software. So we can uh, scan the radio. You can see they're both going at once. Um, we can actually uh, select presets here. And you'll notice those are the presets that I saved on the radio itself. Uh, we can even scan to a new station and save that to a preset. Uh, also, of course, we can, uh, you know, adjust the volume, although you don't see that reflected here because it's actually just adjusting it in Windows. I'll uh, show you that in a minute. And that's pretty much it, right? Like, um, you can't use the CD playback option because, well, if you were going to do that, you just play your disc in Windows Media Player. You put this in, and a moment later, Windows just pops up and uh, we can play it in software like normal. In fact, you know what? I hadn't even tried this before. When you start Windows Media Player, uh, the radio app closes itself politely. So yeah, that's all it does, but um, really what more could you ask for? It's um, <laughs> it's a damn radio, what more can it really do? All the same though, I, I, I do have to admit, there was a universe where it would only be possible to use the radio when the PC was off. And I would have been critical of that, but I wouldn't have been surprised because uh, we can believe that the radio module in here is some off the shelf jelly bean part that isn't tied into the PC at all. You know, just a separate device that's built into the same case. Uh, but this is obviously not true because the software has total control over it. Well, okay, not total. You can do everything except change the equalizer mode. I have no idea why, but you can't. But in every other regard, uh, everything works the same here as it does there. And in fact, let's go ahead and put this machine in standby. All right, the, uh, the letters PC have turned yellow, indicating the thing is in standby. And if I now hit Hi-Fi, hey, there it is. Uh, this can actually run while the PC is either shut off or in standby. And if we go to presets here and select preset five, there we go. That's the one I just saved from Windows. So they're actually written into memory on the radio itself, goes both directions. And just for good measure, let's uh, find one more station here, and then we'll save that to preset number six, then power the PC back up. Start the radio app, and just like that, preset number six is saved. So there's definitely bi-directional communication regarding the data, but now how about the audio? Well, uh, it's making its way into the PC through basically an auxiliary input on the sound chip. You can see here we've got a slider in the Windows volume mixer for radio. Uh, and in fact, if we adjust the volume in the app here, it just changes that input. So it's actually being um, uh, mixed and routed internally in the, the AC97 audio codec. A side effect of that is that the radio is also available as a recording input, and that is kind of a strange topic. I lied to you, there's one other feature in the uh, radio app. If we click this little pip down here, hey, look at that, it's a recorder. Turns out you can record directly off the radio. 
very sensible feature, but let's give it a shot. Let's just record a few seconds of this, not long enough for me to get YouTube content ID'd. Okay, now we hit stop, it immediately asks us to save it. It's kind of annoying, I wish you could listen to it before you save it, but uh, let's just call that Radio 1, like the uh, the hit by, um, what, Fr French? French band? Air, I think? Okay, I muted the radio, let's uh, play that file now. Huh. That's like, um, it's like 8 kilohertz. Your guess is as good as mine. I don't know what's going on here. The The app does have a settings dialog, but there's nothing in here. All you can do is select uh, which region you're in, and then you can set the uh, presets, uh, both AM and FM separately, and that's it. There's, there's nothing else. Oh, and just for good measure, I did check, and uh, there aren't any other options in here. So you're stuck with that one very low audio quality. So this is weird, right? Like, if this feature wasn't here, I don't think I'd have missed it. I mean, I mean, being a nerd, I never would have used it anyway. Even if it was there, I would have just installed some generic recorder like, um, you know, Cool Edit back in the day or Audacity nowadays. But if we just fire up, like, um, let's do Sound Recorder. Let's just go into our uh, recording mixer and turn on the radio. There we go. That's selected. Now if we hit Record, okay, looks like we're getting audio. Now let's play that back. If you look at Dustin Lynch's Instagram, I'm sure you'll find... Yeah, yeah, that's that's full quality. So there's really no reason they couldn't have done it. How did they arrive at this decision? I mean, by 2003, there was really no excuse for recording anything less than 44 kilohertz. Every new computer in existence had the CPU power, the memory, and the disk space to record like that for hours and hours. And as you saw, Sound Recorder defaults to those settings. So, buh? And I realize the average user might not have been able to figure out how to record on their own, so integrating the feature into the app itself makes sense, but that just makes it even weirder that MSI, having gone out of their way to include this, went on to implement it so poorly. I have to assume this is a bug, but I don't know how that's possible. Um, there's a readme included with this, which turns out to actually be a change log, and that clearly shows that the app was under development for at least several months, during which time multiple major changes and bug fixes regarding recording got committed. So surely this problem was known. Why the hell didn't they fix it? And speaking of strange software behavior, the volume knob does odd things. As I mentioned, when you adjust this guy here, it just changes the uh, radio slider. Well, if you rotate this knob, it does the same thing, right? Now you might assume this is just acting as a normal uh, media control, like when you have a keyboard that's got volume up and down buttons, uh, and that the app is just hooking it instead of letting it pass through to Windows. But this isn't actually true. If we close this app entirely, and then we rotate the knob, this little pop-up appears on the desktop, and that slider reflects the status of the uh, master volume control in Windows. Now let's open up Windows Media Player. Now if we adjust it, it turns down Windows Media Player itself, and I can tell you that's not what a keyboard volume control does. In fact, I don't need to tell you. I can just show you. All right, these are standard Windows Media keys, and if I mute it, nothing happens in Windows Media Player. And if we close that, the mute controls the main system volume, as do the volume adjustments themselves. And if we open the uh, radio app, this too is not affected by standard Windows media controls. What actually makes the volume control work is this little icon down here in the system tray called Listen Music. If we uh, close that, nothing doing. So for some reason, MSI decided to implement this as a totally custom hardware component and then use this piece of software to make it actually do everything. In fact, uh, per the change log, they coded in specific support for Windows Media Player itself. This seems like a really odd way of doing that, but yeah, I, I don't know. I guess it made sense to them. Now, I need to point out that I, I don't really understand how these apps work. As I'm gonna show you in a bit when I open the machine up, there really is a distinct radio module in there, which these programs are talking to, but I don't know how they talk to it. There's nothing in the Windows Device Manager, uh, like I went through every single category, there's nothing in there for it, no USB devices, nothing. And I never installed any drivers. I've been through the program files uh, that came with the uh, the radio app. There's no drivers in there either, no .sys files or anything. There is a DLL, but that's clearly the uh, radio control library. It's named MSI Drive IF, and it exports a bunch of methods referring to the LCD, to the uh, radio status and control, volume, mute, etc. So that's clearly what's talking to it, but it's also not a device driver. All of its imports are basic system calls and innocuous utility functions. So 
it's got to be using some basic Windows API to talk to the device over SM bus or I2C or something, but I don't know how to find out what. In any case, though, there is a radio module. And as I showed you, it has no battery and no non-volatile memory. So when we pull the power, it loses all of its information. I'm going to do that again and then show you how that interacts with the software. You will notice the clock is currently set to the right time. Um, well, <laughs> it's set to the same time as Windows, 1937. Okay, let's pull the power. Plug it back in. Okay, we've got no time. And uh, if we jump into the uh, radio here, we have no presets. Now let's turn the PC on. Bonk. Look at that. The time is back. You know what? You know what? <laughs> That's fascinating because I was about to tell you that this was accomplished by that Listen Radio app, but at that stage in the boot process, when you're still on the splash screen, no userland software has launched. So there has to be a service or a driver loading that did that, because I know that that will never set itself to the system clock until you get into Windows, and it never did it before I installed the software. All right, I figured it out. I had to use a boot log to, to find out which uh, files were being loaded, but there really is a driver. I don't know what installed it, but uh, this thing here called MPC Sys is a non-plug-and-play driver in Windows. And if I come in here and I disable this, then start the radio app, You'll notice the panel does nothing, uh, and the uh, <laughs> preset number six is sort of freaking out here, and nothing works. Now let's go back to the driver, turn it back on, and there we go. Bob's your uncle. So, yeah, uh, I just was not looking hard enough. I knew there had to be a driver somewhere. Anyway, though, uh, the point that I was going to make is that uh, now that we've uh, started back up after clearing the memory in this thing, all of our radio presets are gone, and the software has not reloaded them. I mean, it's nice enough to um, uh, set the clock back to the system time, which means that, you know, I, I made that quip earlier about how the, the two clocks can get out of sync and how silly that seems, but realistically, if you're running uh, the MSI software, that's never going to happen, right? You run NTP in Windows, and then um, every time that you start the OS, uh, it connects to this thing and updates the clock from the system clock, so it's no big deal. But the radio preset thing still sucks. Anytime you unplug the machine, which, mind you, isn't all that common, but still, when you do it, you're going to have to reset all your stations again. And that's probably just due to a very simple coding oversight. You'll recall that when I set the uh, stations here, they get imported to the software. Well, they should have coded the program so that if it starts up and sees that all the presets are the same, it doesn't import them and instead reloads the, um, the last known set from the hard drive and pushes them back to the module. And this is a really easy thing to mess up. You know, maybe just nobody ever noticed that it did this or, or maybe it just wasn't worth the effort, but uh, it would have been a nice little bit of polish. Would have made the whole thing gel uh, just that little bit better. Ultimately, though, these are some really minor complaints. The stereo mostly works exactly as you'd hope it would, and the software integration is a lot better than I expected, so I figure most people who own this machine would not have been bothered by these minor issues. So let's set the stereo components aside for the moment, because MSI also sold this as a gaming appliance. So how does it equip itself there? Well, uh, the current hardware specs are not the best. That CPU is kind of crappy, for instance. But again, that's the fault of the person who built it. Uh, this thing can take almost any Athlon ever made. Yeah, up to the uh, 3000 plus. I think the only one they made above that was the 3200. And uh, it'll take dual channel memory up to, well, this says DDR333, but I could have sworn I read that it would do 400. Hmm. Well, in any case, you can put two gigs of memory in it in dual channel. That's quite a bit and quite sprightly if you've got the money for it. So that's pretty good. So you can kit this thing out with nearly top of the line components, including the best graphics cards of the era. Uh, the Enforce 2, uh, a solid chipset for gaming in the first place, also offers AGP-8X. So you could put a Radeon 9800 or anything else in here. But what's really neat is that you might not actually have needed to. As mentioned, the uh, onboard chipset includes a GeForce 4 MX. I believe it's an MX440. Now, that's far from the best card of 2003, but a lot of stuff would still run fine on this. Now, I was going to hand wave that point, but then I decided this was actually a really important question. How much of a gaming rig was this straight out of the box? Well, as it turns out, a pretty damn good one by the average individual standards. 
I ran through a gauntlet of popular contemporary 3D games, and I was frankly a lot more impressed than I expected. I totally underestimated the machine at first, like got my years off, so I started with Unreal Tournament 99, and that just ran like gangbusters. It put out a near constant 60 FPS, even at its maximum resolution of 1024 by 768. I don't know why it won't go higher than that, but uh, for 2003, 2004, that was a perfectly reasonable resolution. Now, it shouldn't be surprising that the game ran so well. It was five years old, but you gotta understand, the MX440 is sort of considered a consolation prize by most enthusiasts, um, something you get instead of the Intel onboard graphics, and that's all you can really say for it. So I don't know that I'd ever really tested one. I didn't really know what it would do. So I was starting to get cocky. I moved on to UT2004, and unfortunately it stumbled right out of the gate. Now there's gonna be some flickering here in a moment, so I'll let you know when that's over, but uh, 2K4 started up at 800 by 600, and I immediately set it to 1024, but the UI began doing this bizarre image corruption, like uh, a TV that had lost vertical hold. If you look closely, you can see there's these weird diagonal tearing artifacts. Very odd, but if I set it back to 800 by 600, it uh, fixes it. Uh, the flickering is gone now. It's probably a driver issue, but still weird. Never seen anything like it. Anyway, I set everything to high, I jumped into a bot match, and this time it wasn't quite as impressive. Uh, 40 to 50 FPS at best, usually more like 30. But remember, at this point in time, far fewer people consider 60 FPS an achievable goal. Uh, 30 was the realistic target that virtually everybody shot for unless they were running top of the line hardware, so I played against bots for a bit and I had no trouble. I mean, the occasional dips below 30 irritated me, being somebody who does use top of the line hardware these days, but Honestly, it didn't interfere with gameplay as much as the miserable ball mouse I was using. I ended up capturing several flags in the end. And I suspect that this slowdown is actually a CPU limitation because it happens regardless of the graphics settings. Even at 640, with everything on low, I can't get over 50 FPS in some places, so I suspect if I dropped a hotter Athlon in here, I'd have a better time. At this point, I was getting really overconfident, so uh, I decided to install Halo 1. That had come out for PC just a few months earlier, so I fired it up and was immediately disappointed. Even at 640x480, it couldn't exceed 30 FPS. But it turns out this is because it's limited to 30 on purpose. You can go in and disable that limiter, and that got me much higher frame rates. Not consistently, but, you know, anything beats the maximum of 30 that you get on the Xbox, its flagship platform. So if you were playing this online, it was it was totally playable, no question. People would have enjoyed this. The single player, on the other hand, was a different story. It seemed good enough as I came in on the dropship, but the moment the beach loaded, the FPS dropped below 30, probably below 20 most of the time. Now, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, a lot of people would still have considered this perfectly acceptable, but I didn't then, and I don't now. You'd really have wanted a real GPU if you wanted to enjoy the Halo campaign. Next up, I happened to notice Splinter Cell in a list of demos, so I grabbed that. Didn't expect much, and I wasn't disappointed. It rarely exceeds 30 FPS, even at 640, and even indoors. Once again, almost nobody would have cared back in the day, and it played just like this, or worse, on consoles. But a bigger problem I ran into is that the thermal vision seems to have some Z-buffer issues. Things appear and disappear through walls, which I don't remember happening when this game was new. But curiously, I couldn't confirm that. I checked four separate playthroughs on YouTube, and nobody ever seems to use the thermal scope, just night vision. Am I the only person who found this useful, or have all these people just played the game a thousand times and memorized every enemy location? So the pop-in was a little weird, but uh, things were going surprisingly well, so I decided to throw it a curveball. The Doom 3 demo. This was a complete showstopper back in the day, and I don't mean that it was really impressive and blew away all the other games, I mean that there wasn't a computer in existence that could run it because it just sucked. Like, it wasn't that visually impressive, it was just the worst optimized game engine in history. Everything based on it ran like crap, and it still does, so I didn't expect much, but after waiting a whole five minutes for it to load, I still managed to be let down. The game runs at 10 FPS or less most of the time, with everything at minimum. I can't see anything, and I don't know why. I mean, the game was always dark, but even after cranking the gamma, the floor is just a black void. Random polygons will just be dark for no reason. Characters are half dark, half ghostly white. It's totally unplayable, but I don't hold that against the machine because Doom 3 was never playable. At this point, I needed a palette cleanser, so I tried Far Cry, which had just come out. Results were mixed. Uh, at first, it started up in 1024 by 768, and I got the same bug as in UT, except this time it was a, a very slowly rolling TV picture that sped up and, and slowed down whenever I moved the mouse. It, it's even stranger here. I have no idea what this means. And again, switching to 800 by 600 fixed it. It's gotta be some sort of driver issue, right? 
Now, once we get in game, it seems to run pretty well at first glance. Again, 30 or 40 FPS average it was acceptable for the time, but I really think it should be faster because when I decrease the resolution, it doesn't seem to make much difference. So again, I, I think this might be CPU bound. A bigger problem is that uh, the game seems to have a lot of graphical artifacts. The textures don't, don't look right. They look blurrier than I think they should, even on maximum. Also, uh, when I started moving forward, I began to enter areas with totally incorrect lighting, just uh, these huge chunks of the map that were just black when they shouldn't be. I also found some models that were missing half their faces, um, and like random parts of the terrain were just randomly turning black, so this is actually unplayable. And it's either a driver issue or the GeForce 4 being from the wrong generation, and I'm not really sure which. Next up, I tried Max Payne 2, which was absolutely hot shit at the time and still one of the best games ever made, so I was pleased to find that it runs very well, over 30 FPS at all times, and often significantly higher even at 800 by 600. Again, there are some dips, but they don't hurt the gameplay at all, especially since most of your shooting is supposed to take place in bullet time anyway. Now, when I got to the second level, there was a bit more geometric complexity that uh, bogged things down a little bit. Uh, reducing the resolution did buy me a few more FPS, but once again, I think a better CPU might have helped. Now, the final game I tested was Return to Castle Wolfenstein, and to my shock, it didn't work. I mean, this is a Quake 3 based game. It was two years old at the time, and it should have run on a potato or a toaster with no trouble, but all I got was a black screen. I could hear the cursor moving on the menu, so the game was running, I just couldn't see anything. Now, there may have been a patch for this, or maybe it was, again, a driver issue, but at this point, I figured that I knew what I needed to know. Other than, you know, per game bugs, which was very common at this point in time, this machine was clearly ready for gaming right out of the box. Now, uh, since we're here, I, I wanted to share an interesting bit of trivia about this era in computing. I nearly gave this PC a totally different review because when I first tried UT99, a five-year-old game, I got less than 40 FPS, even at 640 by 480. And my knee-jerk response was, well, what did you expect? It's basically a laptop GPU. I mean, in this era, the purpose of having non-Intel integrated graphics was often just to get dual head capability or TV out, since Intel didn't really have those features. But as you will have noticed during the benchmarks, I wanted to see how games looked on the TV output. And the answer is they look great, and this would have been a fantastic machine to park next to your 36 inch CRT or projection set back in the day, except by default, TV output on all graphics cards back then was severely underscanned for some reason. There was always a huge black border on all sides, which is completely infuriating, but you can fix it from the NVIDIA control panel. Trouble is, I didn't have that because I was using the cutdown drivers that MSI provided on their website. I know, I know. My reflexes had just gotten rusty, all right? You see, nowadays, you can more or less get away with using whatever sludge you get from Windows Update or, or even the drivers that come with a pre-built PC. You might lose a few percent off your frame rate compared to getting the latest drivers from NVIDIA or AMD, but it's gonna work mostly fine. Back in 2003, it didn't. Literally every driver included on a CD or on a manufacturer's website was straight up broken. None of them worked and everyone knew to simply never use them no matter what because this is exactly what would happen. When I installed the drivers from Nvidia's site, not only did it give me the control panel so I could fix the overscan, but my performance quadrupled. I mean, this is how it was back then, but like, why? Why did no manufacturer ever do even the most basic tests? It's, it's anyone's guess, it doesn't make any sense. But for what it's worth, since we pretty much all knew how this worked, I doubt many people back in the day would have been affected by it. So, in conclusion, this machine is pretty cool. I mean, had MSI not equipped it with the integrated graphics, I, I think it would have made a lot less sense. The fact that you could build up a machine with just a CPU, RAM, and a hard drive, and then get straight to gaming really puts it over the top. Like, don't get it twisted, the GPU would have made a huge difference. Per contemporary benchmarks, a Radeon 9800 would have absolutely wiped the floor with this thing. But probably very few hardcore gamers would have built their battle stations around <laughs> this kind of machine. And just as nowadays, the majority of gamers use hardware that's at least five years old and don't expect maximum performance, the frame rate and visual quality that we just saw was acceptable to a lot of people in its day. For its target market, I think this was probably very appealing, especially since the price was right. I can't find an MSRP, but apparently in late 04, one gamer bought theirs for $240 and was lamenting the prices had gone up in 05 by like a hundred bucks. 
I mean, after CPU, RAM, and a hard drive, you'd be closer to $700, depending on what you got, but that's still a great deal for a mid-range gaming machine that you can just plug into your TV. So if you find one of these, I recommend you snatch it up. As a 2000s retro gaming machine, it's kind of hard to beat. But uh, setting our opinions of the Mega as a product aside, we now need to look at this as a piece of electronics. This might sound weird, but 2003 was a bit early for thumb screws. I mean, they were around, but I wouldn't be surprised to learn the machine didn't come with them. Like anybody could have them if they wanted, but I'm just saying an awful lot of people didn't have them for some reason. Oh, by the way, uh, one weird thing about machines of this sort, uh, these shuttle type PCs often had aluminum chassis. You expect this to have a certain weight to it. It just doesn't. It's, it's weird every time. Anyway, uh, Here's the machine, <laughs> such as it is. This is a uh, sort of the lament of the shuttle PC. They all looked like this inside, just incredibly packed, incredibly miserable, very hard to work in. But besides everything being very close together, this is basically just a normal PC. There's a couple minor deltas, but in order to show you those, I'm gonna have to pull pretty much everything. Uh, so we'll start with the CD-ROM and the hard drive. Hopefully one of these screws let me actually get this cage out of here, but my hopes are not high. Now, as this comes out, uh, take note of the fact we've got three cables back here. This is the standard analog audio jumper. Uh, this is on most PC CD-ROMs and pre-built machines, and it just sends um, uh, audio from the currently playing CD track straight over to the sound card, so it can be mixed uh, in the analog domain. Then, of course, we've got the uh, IDE cable, and then we have the standard power connector, except it has a very strange color code. Purple, black, brown. This doesn't match anything else in the machine and it's not standard uh, PC color codes. Uh, keep that in mind. Now, naturally all the cables in here are quite short. MSI has done their best to make it reasonable by uh, chopping up the ribbons and then um, zip tying them together into these little bundles. Uh, but it's still quite irritating getting things uh, together and apart. I should be able to remove the hard drive. Now, uh, is there any way to get this whole assembly out of here. I think so, if I keep taking out screws. I think we almost got it. Oh, two more there. It almost wants to come out. Oh, I see. It's actually running into the uh, CPU fan assembly. Boy, there's just no breathing room in here. Let's just get that out of there. Now I should mention these shuttle machines always have strange heat sink and fan arrangements in them because of the, the weirdness <laughs> of their environment. Uh, and this one's no exception. Uh, apparently, originally this had two fans on it, one pushing, one pulling. And uh, when I got it, for some reason, the previous owner had removed both of them and not replaced them. So I don't know what, if anything, was cooling the CPU. Now I replaced one of them obviously with this green fan, but the other one plugs into this little tiny proprietary header here. So I, I just had to leave that empty for the time being. Weird business. Again, if, if you're the person who owned this and you can tell me what happened there, I'd love to know. Okay, so now we should be able to get this drive tray out of here. Okay, I think it might be hitting the RAM. So let's take that out. By the way, this is what gamer RAM used to look like. Instead of RGB, we just had fake gold, and these things weigh about a half a pound. All right, did that work? My God, it is still hitting something. <laughs> oh, I hate working on these things. It's so miserable. It, it feels like it should come right out, but it won't. Oh, it was running into the heat sink again. Oh, oh, we got it. Finally. Oh my God, there's a cable looped through it. This one. Look at this, this hateful little piece of metal. Oh, don't make anything like this. Oh, and it's, it's aluminum. So that's like Anne Graham. All right, all right. Okay, we're making progress here. Let's pull the power supply next. Not done yet. <laughs> There's still something holding it in, isn't there? Oh, no, it's just, again, running into the CPU. So we've got to take that out. 
Now this was in the brief period when CPUs had exposed dyes, and that meant you had to be very careful when you were putting heat sinks on and taking them off, because if you got the pressure a little uneven, in fact, I was about to do it in the wrong order, I think, uh, then you could actually um, uh, seesaw the sink directly on the exposed core and uh, crack it and destroy it. Is that it? Are we done? Mm, almost. There we go. That is like two pounds of copper. I don't know how much that is in kilograms. And there's your dye imprint. Little tiny babby amount of thermal compound. That enormous hunk of copper. Uh, you can see, by the way, the imprints from the pads. Uh, these little guys right here were meant to keep the uh, heat sink from seesawing, like I said. And they did not do that reliably. So a lot of people would buy these um, uh, these custom aftermarket shims. They would cover the entire top of the CPU except for the die uh, to give it more of a uh, fighting chance. All right. Oh, I just almost stuck my hand into the power supply. There's probably still high voltage lingering in the capacitors in there. That would have been fun. Uh, still won't come out. Oh, there we go. I think it was binding on its own power cable. Let's uh, try unplugging this before we proceed. Oh, it's the zip tie. Guys, I don't think you needed to cable manage it. It wasn't going anywhere. Holy hell, it still does not want to come out. Oh no! So this header on the outside is actually fed from the original source of power <laughs> in the supply. The previous owner just drilled a hole in the PSU and passed the wires through there, but that means this is bound in place by that header. So now I've got to go in here and very carefully nip that, then use another set of metal implements in this high voltage device to try and get that out. There we go. Okay, is that enough to get this bastard out? Oh boy, this sucks. I, I, I admit I had not taken this apart when I wrote the script about taking it apart. So I was actually totally unprepared for how miserable this was going to be. I thought it was going to suck, but I didn't know it was going to suck this much. Oh, okay. And I just uh, ripped off one of these leads. So let's go ahead and finish the job. All right. And I'll fix that later. So let's talk about this power supply. This is a strange bird. I don't think it'll shock anybody. <laughs> if I tell you that this power supply is proprietary and unique to this line of machines. Now, on its face, it, it already looks a little remarkable because it's a 250 watt, which sounds piddling, and even by the standards of the time, it, it sort of was. I can't recall what a typical PC power supply was at this point. I mean, certainly nobody had 800 to 1000 watt units like we do now, but I think 300, 350 was not uncommon. And I got one of the first modular power supplies ever made, the unbelievably gaudy Ultra X Connect around this time, and that was rated at 500. It also had very unreliable connectors and that led to a lot of data loss, but that's another story. Anyway, um, in these shuttle type machines, which were not powerhouses, you would usually find a 180 to 200 watt supply. And that was usually fine because the top of the line Athlon only hit 77 watts. And even if you had a GPU, uh, very few needed auxiliary power at this point. But well, for one thing, they did make a Pentium 4 version of this machine, which I believe pulled quite a bit more power. And uh, you could put a Radeon 9800 in here, which would draw 77 watts all on its own. So a beefier supply, at least by shuttle standards, was the right call. But this supply has more than just wattage up its sleeve. You'll recall, I pointed out, the connector for the uh, CD-ROM has different colors than all the others. And it's got this weird little thing dangling off of it. This weird little thing actually plugs into the motherboard right over here. That's unusual. <laughs> Most motherboards did not have a plug like this. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, you may recall that uh, when we had just the hi-fi section on earlier, you didn't hear any fans. Um, the power supply was not running. If it was, then the, the PC motherboard would have been on and it would have booted up, but it didn't. So this was off and yet it's the only source of power in the machine. The 110 volts goes straight into it. So how is it running the CD-ROM drive and the radio? Well, PC power supplies have multiple voltage rails. You got your 3.3 volts, uh, your five volts, your 12 volts, and so on. And then you always have one called plus five VSB. That's five volt standby. And the purpose of that is, uh, well, when your motherboard's off, 
if it wants to be able to turn the machine on via like uh, wake on LAN, wake on timer, or even just by pressing the button on the front, it needs power to run semiconductors to send a signal to the power supply yeah, now you got a problem. So the five volt standby rail provides five volts at all times. Um, I can show you this. Just um, be really careful not to stick my fingers in the exposed high volt circuitry. All right, if we take a look at the ATX connector here, uh, that's 12 volts, nothing doing. And uh, right above that is five volts, nothing doing. But if we take a look at purple here, Hey, look at that, 5.2 volts. That is the five volt standby line. And you may notice purple right here. Sure enough, we got five volts, even though the supply isn't on. And if we look at our other Molex connectors, um, we do not have the five volts and we do not have the 12 volts. However, on this one, we have both the five and the 12. What makes this supply unique is that in addition to having the plus five VSB, it also has a plus 12 VSB. Uh, also, uh, the five volt rail is uh, much beefier. Typically, that's not a whole lot of current. Here, it provides three amps, and the 12 volt provides two and a half amps on the uh, brown wire. So in other words, uh, this power supply is, is never actually turned off. We have juice to run the drive there, even though we don't have it here. So this trick allows uh, some components of the machine to be running even when the rest of it uh, is off. And of course, uh, since some of the components that um, control the, the, the radio feature and whatnot are built into the motherboard, and the motherboard does not normally get that 12 volt standby signal because there's no pin on the ATX connector for it, they had to add a new plug to get the brown lead into the motherboard. Now, the odd thing about this is that they also included two grounds which are already coming through on the ATX connector, and the 5 volt standby, which is also on the ATX connector. Maybe it just sucks finding a single wire connector? Or maybe the part of the motherboard that runs the radio circuitry is just very heavily isolated from the rest. I, I don't know. Anyway, uh, at this point, we're going to need to get a clearer look at that motherboard, so I'm going to have to pull it out, which I don't want to do. But we do what we must. All right, was that adequate? Oh, I gotta take the back panel off. <laughs> the back panel got glued on by that same epoxy. Ooh, and that's tough stuff. Oh, <laughs> wow. All right, with that out, I believe the motherboard will slide backwards. I hate taking the boards out of these things so much. Oh, does the front come off? I see that's a daughter board. And now I believe this will lift out of here. Oh, at last. All right, we can finally look at this thing. So I don't think any of the shuttle type machines ever used an officially recognized board footprint, but this is basically the dimensions that all of them were. It is uh, like a third again wider than mini ITX, which gives it just a bit more breathing room. So we have a full size CPU socket, full size RAM, uh, PCI and AGP slots, all typical desktop stuff. Uh, one unusual thing though is the mini PCI slot. This is being used to host a raw link Wi-Fi card. And that makes a lot of sense. Um, because you don't need Wi-Fi to be, you know, sticking out the back of the machine, then it doesn't make sense to take up one of the uh, precious few slots in here. Uh, the trouble is, though, it makes it really easy to miss that this machine has Wi-Fi at all. Like, <laughs> I didn't even know until I opened it up, I think, and I saw that, and I'm like, what the hell is that thing? And then uh, I noticed that uh, it had antennas attached to it. But, like, where do they go? Well, it turns out it's too little tiny metal strips on the front panel. And that's it, that's all the Wi-Fi you get. And uh, since they're just buried in there, there's no SMA connectors on the outside or anything. If those don't work, then, um, well, good luck. I mean, I guess you could get like an MCX to SMA adapter. Those do exist. Uh, drill some holes in the chassis, add your own antenna jacks. It's fixable, but still, it's kind of irritating. Anyway, uh, virtually everything else about this board is completely normal. 
uh, with the exception of the capacitors. Not a single one of them is blown, and that's shocking. I don't think I've ever seen a machine of this vintage in this form factor uh, that actually had working caps. Let's see, are they anybody? You know, I was going to say that I couldn't find a legible name on any of these caps, but then I noticed uh, this M with the bent legs, and I looked that up, and people online say that's the, the Panasonic logo. I'm just going to go ahead and assume the Panasonic does not mess around with capacitors, so it looks like MSI actually did buy some really high-grade stuff for this board. Every single one on here seems to be from them. And the proof's in the pudding. <laughs> thing still works perfectly. I wish more companies had done this. Uh, but anyway, yeah, that's the only unusual thing about this board, other than this and that. The uh, first thing is the radio module. Let's just get this cable out of the way. I don't know a single thing about these. Uh, there's a part number on there, though. NS81M10BU1. And uh, frankly, I don't know really anything about radio, so I'm just going to go ahead and back away from this thing entirely. Uh, take it as read that this is an ordinary radio module and it's being controlled by something somewhere on the board. The much juicier fruit is this chip right here, the Bluebird VL+. Plus. When I opened this machine up, that was the very first thing I saw, and I immediately knew that it was the brains of the operation. This chip is made by a company named Silicon Motion, who I've never heard of. Uh, they have made many things before. Nowadays, they seem to be involved in flash and SSD controllers, and that's all I know. There are no data sheets online for this chip, no specs, no manuals, no mention of its existence really at all outside of the occasional reference in a review of the MSI Mega series. I did find mention of it in a patent that Silicon Motion holds, but it doesn't really describe much of interest other than suggesting that the Bluebird may contain a microcontroller core based on the extremely common Intel 8051. A much more useful reference I found, though, was this service manual for a Eurocom laptop from 2005 made by Clevo, which appears to use this chip the same way that MSI did. Now, obviously, there are some differences. Uh, the laptop is based on vastly different PC hardware from several years later, and it has several different features, but I had a set of fundamental questions about how all this works, and this seems to answer them to my satisfaction. The principle here is simple enough, right? We take it as read that there are two computers on this motherboard, even if we don't know the second one's nature, because when the PC is off, something must be executing code to control the faceplate and talk to the CD-ROM and to the radio module. That second computer is somehow sharing the audio jacks, uh, the CD-ROM, and the radio module with the PC, so how are those components switched back and forth? Now, this could be done with a simple multiplexer chip, like a, a little solid-state KVM that just unplugs the drive from one machine and plugs it into the other, but maybe something more involved is happening, and I'd like to know which. Uh, I also wanted to know how smart this second computer is. It has to talk to the CD-ROM, but does it have a full implementation of the Atapi protocol, or just barely enough intelligence to throw some preformed play commands down the pipe? And once the CD is playing, how does it get the sound out? over the analog port or as data over the IDE cable, which is a lot more involved. Well, the block diagram of this laptop answers most of those questions. Down here, we have the Bluebird chip. Above that is the ICH6, that's the uh, South Bridge, the PC's uh, IO controller. And below that is the CD-ROM and the hard drive. So uh, that's question one, you know, assuming nothing is missing from this diagram, the IDE chains actually pass fully through the Bluebird chip. So it presumably contains the necessary switching circuitry to let it take over control when it detects that the uh, PC is not energized. Now, I'm not the best at reading schematics, but I'm pretty sure they confirm this uh, later on. Here on page 22, uh, this is the Bluebird VL chip. Now, we don't have expanded names for all these pins, so we're not exactly sure what they do, but we can suss it out. This group of pins here, this is obviously a data bus. This is called a CDD we can guess that this would be going to the CD-ROM drive. Uh, indeed, these get bussed together, all 15 of them, and they go off to page 12. Also, if we come down here, here's a group of pins called PIDE. We can guess this is the uh, uh, parallel IDE controller. Those also get bussed off to page 12. So let's go look at page 12. All right, here we are on page 12. Uh, this is the computer's south bridge, and we'll notice that we have a block of pins down here called PIDE, and these are going into the IDE interface on the south bridge. Uh, those get bussed together and go over to page 21, where we just were. And if we scroll over here to the right, this is the CD-ROM drive uh, interface connector, and here's those CDD lines. 
And if we scroll up, we see those are also shared with the hard drive connector because of course they're bussed together, they're on the same chain. And above those, we see that they all leave to page 21. So if we stitch this all together, we realize that in between here and there is the Bluebird chip. So it really is just consuming the entire IDE interface and passing it through to the PC. So if the Bluebird were to decide to power up and take over while the machine was running, it could cause vast amounts of data corruption. So I guess they just made sure it, would, it didn't do that. Problem solved. So one of the other questions was, uh, how does it share the audio jacks? Now, uh, this is simple enough. Integrated audio on PCs always involves a codec of some sort. Uh, this is what we would think of as a sound card if we bought it on its own. And then there's always a separate amplifier or preamplifier. Uh, on a laptop, you have a full-on amp, right? Because there's going to be speakers in there. And then it also breaks out to the uh, headphone jack, the speed if, and so on. Well, here in the laptop, we see that the uh, PC has an Azalea codec. Azalea is Intel's code name for the HD audio standard, which is what all our computers use now. Uh, and in 2005, it was pretty new, but it was picking up speed very quickly. And then we also see that the Bluebird has its own AC97 codec, which is not connected to the PC. Now, this is interesting. I chased through the schematics for a bit, trying to figure out how they all plug together. And it seems that they just merge at the input to the preamp, uh, which isn't surprising. Um, you can just take one or two or, or four sound chips and just plug them all into the back of the amplifier. And um, well, if multiple are outputting audio at once, you might get strange effects, but as long as only one is on at any given moment, that's probably fine. Now, why the two codecs? Well, we can assume that the Bluebird chip had not been updated since it was first created several years earlier, so it was probably designed to speak directly to AC97 because that was the standard codec everything used at that time. So uh, when Intel HDA came out, the Bluebird didn't get updated. So it has its own codec here, but I would guess that in the MSI, uh, which is using an AC97, uh, there's probably just one that's being shared between the PC and the Bluebird. And again, as long as only one device talks to it at a time, uh, then you don't have a problem. This guy up here, this real tech chip, that's gonna be your AC97. And I've looked around this board quite a bit and I can't find another one. So I'm pretty sure that they just share one codec chip. Now, if you notice the same thing I did while editing this video, you might think I made a mistake here. In Windows, the sound card shows up as Enforce 2, not Realtek. And when I saw that, I thought, well, I must be wrong. The chip is dedicated to the Hi-Fi. So I put an oscilloscope on it and confirmed that audio comes out of that chip while using the Hi-Fi mode. Then I put the PC back together, booted into Windows, played an MP3, and found that I still see the sound in the exact same place. Now, if the outputs of two codecs were coupled at the amplifier, this wouldn't be surprising, but it made me suspicious anyway. So I did some digging. If I understand this correctly, the Enforce 2 does not have a complete audio codec. It has some kind of intermediate DSP to improve sound, but to actually get it out of the PC, you still have to plug it into an AC97 chip over something called AC Link. So I'm still certain that both devices are using this one codec. Now, my next question was going to be, how smart is this chip? Can it actually speak, you know, full-blown IDE? Uh, and I came up with a really easy way to test that. I just started playing a CD, and then I unplugged the analog audio cable, and it kept playing, even though the only thing plugged into the CD-ROM was the IDE cable. That means uh, that this was actually piping the audio out digitally using uh, the uh, digital audio extraction or DAE feature. And it's hard enough to get that working reliably under Windows, so that pretty much assures us that the Bluebird is speaking a tappy fluently. So that largely answers my questions. Uh, the one thing left dangling is uh, how does this talk to the radio? There must be some GPIO pins on here, but uh, of course, without the data sheet, we can't suss out enough information to see where those would be. And as far as I can tell, the laptop didn't have a radio. It was only doing the CD audio playback thing. So uh, this uh, schematic won't be useful anyway. It does tell us a little bit of information. For instance, uh, we can see that this thing has several uh, I2C interfaces. Looks like there's one here. Uh, one there, and I think I found at least one other. Uh, this one's actually being used to talk to uh, an SD card reader. So this one apparently could uh, play MP3s off of a flash card or something like that. I also noticed that this has a USB interface, but uh, I'm guessing that's not how it ever talked to the PC because it's just um, it's just dummied out here, I believe. Uh, that probably would have been used uh, to play MP3s off of a flash drive. So I'm still a little unsure on exactly how this thing talks to the host system or to the radio, but um, we obviously have enough pins here that, you know, <laughs> there are many ways it could be done. So we won't worry about that too much. Uh, speaking of pins though, I did notice that apparently all the controls on the front of the thing are just hooked up to uh, individual 
pins, one per button. Like it's not being scanned as a matrix or anything like that. It's just key one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And that does make sense because this chip appears to have been built to do exactly this and nothing else. And indeed, the one other reference I found to this specific chip, a press release from Silicon Motion, describes it as an embedded DSP with 56 kilobytes of SRAM intended to enable MP3 audio players to utilize voice record functions with background noise cancellation and to directly interface with CD-ROM drives, allowing notebook computers to play back MP3 or audio CDs during sleep mode. And that's what narrowly qualified this as a quick start video. The actual intent of the Bluebird product was to add the functionality we just saw to laptops specifically, so that if you wanted to use your laptop to listen to music while out and about, you didn't have to wait for the machine to boot or run your battery down, since I'm sure this draws a lot less power on the Bluebird than it does on the Athlon. So much like the other machines we've seen in Quick Start Guide N, this actually makes sense. I mean, putting it in a desktop PC is a bit less obviously useful, but like I said, I can imagine parking this next to the TV in the living room, hooking it up to an amplifier so you can enjoy listening to CDs without firing up your whole PC or needing a separate stereo system, and yeah, that seems like a good idea. But in order for it to make sense as, you know, a value add on an otherwise complete gaming system, it had to impart very little additional cost and complexity, which is why it makes so much sense that Silicon Motion designed it the way they did. Putting the IDE bus circuitry in the chip itself, instead of using an external switch, meant that MSI could add this capability by just dropping one chip onto an otherwise normal motherboard. And while I don't have the skills or documentation to prove it, I would guess that the Bluebird is also a general purpose programmable microcontroller since that's usually how chips like this work. Uh, generally speaking, the vendor uh, can put it on the board and then load some custom code onto it so that they don't have to use a separate chip uh, to add whatever you know glue functionality they need. So it's very likely that this is also controlling the LED display, the clock, the radio presets, and probably the radio itself. I couldn't find any other microcontrollers on this board, so that kind of has to be it. Unless, of course, it's this guy right here. This appears to be a custom MSI branded ASIC. Uh, now, there's definitely enough pins on there. This could be anything under the sun, you know, easily a microcontroller. But I feel like shelling out for a custom chip to run this extra functionality kind of defeats the purpose of using the fully integrated one chip solution. So in conclusion, I think the MSI Mega made perfect sense. For 2004. Even a year later, I think MSI would have been too tempted to cram in DVD playback or other media functionality, and that would have torn it. They'd have ended up just delivering a crappy dual boot Linux like most other quick start machines, stripping it of any value whatsoever. But since they designed this in the final moments of the pure hardware solution era, it came in just under the wire and ended up being good instead of incredibly bad and pointless. And I hope you feel the same way about this video. Uh, that it was good, that is, instead of incredibly bad and pointless. It can sometimes be kind of awkward trying to illustrate all this stuff in a short length of time and on one cramped little screen, you know, trying to show off the desktop capture in the front of the PC and everything else that's going on all at once. So hopefully it turned out intelligible and hopefully it was entertaining. If you felt that it was and you're new to my channel, consider subscribing. I try to do stuff at least this interesting as often as I can. And remember to turn on notifications if you want to find out when I upload new stuff. But if you really liked this, then consider supporting me on Patreon like these folks are doing. This is my full-time job and I couldn't do it without the support of viewers like you. My patrons give me a budget to buy weird stuff like this when it pops up on eBay or thrift stores or at the RePC. Not to mention, you know, food and gas and rent and whatnot. So I'm incredibly grateful to everyone who's supporting me. I can't thank you enough and everyone else. Thanks for watching.